Okay, everyone. Well, thank you very much for, uh -oh. for uh, joining us. Um, so today, I wanted to introduce Barry Eggers, uh, the founder of Lightspeed Venture Partners, also a proud UCLA alum. Um, yeah, Barry's uh, had numerous positions at technology companies and has been in the venture capital biz for quite some time and has a phenomenal success. And we're very happy and excited to have you here today, Barry. So thank you for coming. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, so I brought a presentation, but I'm going to sort of skip around and, and keep it brief just because I'd rather just talk freely about other questions that you guys have. This is really your time. Um, so first, a little bit about who am I? Next slide. Perfect. Okay, so little little timeline here. So I went to UCLA. I, I, was, I really came to UCLA to play water polo. That's all I cared about. Um, at the time, I took econ. I was an econ major. Um, uh, it was pretty easy back then. I think it's a lot harder now. Um, I then worked a little bit after UCLA and um, and got accepted to Stanford Business School. It went there for a while, two years. I was the first person uh, recruited out of um, Stanford Business School by a company called Cisco that had just gone public, so it was sort of good timing. Sometimes you get lucky and pick the right companies. Um, and then I, I stayed at Cisco for six years, rode the wave, and got the itch to do something smaller because I had started at Cisco with 400 people. And six years later, it was 12,000 people, a big company. I wanted to get back to roots, so um, I got involved with Lightspeed Venture Partners and became a founder there. And I've been there for 16 years now, so I can't do anything else other than venture. Just I better better do it well, <laughs> not employable. Um, and I, hey, I like wine and scuba dive and all sorts of stuff. So. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. If I just give you a glimpse of what UCLA was like in 1985, there's no underground parking, you know, there's no medical center, uh, no Anderson School. We were a football school. I guess they are again. We won three Rose Bowls during my time. And I can honestly say I went to one Rose Bowl and I saw three plays because I sat outside drinking the whole time. <laughs> but that's what people did back then, social norms, right? And, um, and, I, and I, I clearly it was a lot easier to be admitted to UCLA back then. So a bit about us, you know, we talk about, um, so we're an early stage venture, venture capital firm and we're really focused on, uh, you know, we sort of use the term accelerating disruptive innovation. I want to talk about what I mean by that because as you talk about, think about your businesses, you should be thinking about disruptions. And we do enterprise and consumer IT. Some of the companies that we've been involved with um, <coughs> over the years, uh, both ones that have had liquidity events and ones that are still going. You notice the uh, Snapchat. Um, I'll tell you a funny story. Um, I'll sort of tie it back into what Evan said, but um, I'm an enterprise guy. I invest in enterprise IT technology. <coughs> um, my, I, had a, I have a daughter who was, uh, was a high school student, and when she was a sophomore, she came home one day, as early 2012, and she said, Dad, you know, check out this app on the iPhone, it's called Snapchat. I go, okay, she showed me how it works. She said, everyone's using it. It's as popular as Instagram. I said, well, I know what Instagram is. I'm not, I'm not an idiot, you know, I know a little bit about consumer, but I've never heard of Snapchat. So I took it back and went back to, uh, to my, my group and talked to our internet guys. And I said, Jeremy Liu, I said, have you ever heard of Snapchat? And they said, no, he hadn't heard of it. So, you know, did some research and that's how Jeremy found Evan, but it was a lead from my daughter. Um, and what we did is, you know, we, we have actually a venture, the high school has a venture capital fund, her high school. It's sort of progressive, if you will, it's a valley thing. And I'm on the board of it. So um, we carved out 15,000 in the seed for the high school and it all goes to teachers. And that 15000 is now valued at more than $2 million a year and a half later. So the teachers are, are feeling pretty good about that. <laughs> and we can talk more about the whole Snapchat thing, and maybe I'll answer the, the question you asked about the seed note. I'll give a, you know, I think Evan was being a little kind to me, too, about, uh, you know, some of the, no the terms we put on that seed note. So I'll, I'll fill the, the gap in. Um, and you guys know Whisper, by the way? A local LA company, really hot. Keep your eye on Whisper. Um, there's some good things happening there. A lot of momentum in what they're doing. So it's worth um, 
worth keeping tabs on Whisper and Snapchat. Next. A lot of partners. We have, you know, 2.8 billion under management. A lot of, a lot of things we're doing worldwide, um, but it's early stage. How are we different? Um, I want to talk a little bit about the history. Let's keep going um, of venture capital. Go to the next slide. This is an interesting slide. This is the number of active VC firms. In, in, in uh, the 70s, um, there were seven firms. Sorry, the 70s, there were seven firms. In 2000, there were 600 firms. And then now there's about 160 sort of active sort of venture firms of a specific size. So you know, we've gone through you know, the bubble and, and back down again. It's consolidated a bit. Um, but but you know, what's important here is through all these phases, there's been a common sort of formula for the best firms. And in venture, um, if you look at the distribution of outcomes and returns, it's very skewed, like you might expect. It's, you know, most of the returns come from a small set of firms. We've done a lot of analysis on that, and we, we said even through all these cycles, the formula remains the same. And I'll talk about that formula a little bit. So, so we like to say it's, it's artists plus science um, plus support equals success. And it's, it's always been, you look back in venture, um, this is the formula for success. It is the artists. And I'll talk about what the artists are, but you guys are artists, um, potentially. The science, which is the disruption that's happening that enables an opportunity. And the support is us, right? Is is the venture investor and all the people around the company that can support the company. Um, you know, the artists we like to think of, and this is um this is Picasso, but we we like to think of artists as people that see the final products, you have the vision to see things before others do. And that it's rare. It really is rare. And you know, Evan, you know, you know, is very humble about stuff, but he saw the vision that people were getting tired of the Facebook sort of, you know, thing and that, you know, obviously they're still on Facebook, but that there was a need for a different type of medium for how people communicated. He saw that vision. In this case, you know, with Picasso, he's he already knows, you look at his eyes, he already knows what he's drawing before he draws it. Um, but this is about the visionary scene where things are going. The next slide is also a good example. It's, this is, um, you know, for you who are art students, this is Michelangelo, right? And what he said is, every block, before I just look at the, the block, I can tell what I'm going to, you know, carve out of that. So. That's, that's the artist part, and that's what you guys all aspire to be. But again, it's about seeing things before others do. The science part, I love this picture. I mean, God, I mean, the suits, the white, the, the chalkboard, um, you know, this is NASA scientists, right? And the science is the disruptive part. Something's got to happen to enable some disruption in the market. What is it? What is it about your business? that makes it, you know, why is the opportunity now? And so you should think about that for everything you're doing is why is the opportunity now? What's disrupting the market? And, you know, these, these disruptions, there's, there's really, you know, there's no formula for the disruptions. They can come from a number of different places. They can come from consumers, they can come from science, they can come from, you know, all sorts of places. Academia is a great source of disruption research, um, and they create these sort of waves of opportunities, pardon the puns, but this is Mavericks, those of you that are surfers. Um, so what we like to say is, you know, we take the artists, the science, and then the support in the middle, and that's how we accelerate innovation. Create massive impact. You know, the next one, I'll give you an example of what, what we do is we decide that it's easier to pick, um, it's easier to identify themes or the waves than it is companies. It just is. And so what we like to do, I think the, the, the formula for success in venture has always been find the wave, identify the wave, and then invest in you know, multiple companies. So what do we do? We, we talk to a bunch of visionaries and artists in, in the world you know, that we know, 
we sort of leverage our brand and sort of what we know and people come to us because they think we get it in certain areas, enterprise and consumer, um, you know, and then we look for that disruptive innovation, the macro trend. And we spend a lot of time, frankly, in academia. That's one of the reasons why we, we sponsor this is we want to know what's going on here. We also sponsor a lot of work with uh, professors and, and PhD students um, in certain areas. I'll give you an example. Um, go to the next, actually, yeah, go to, uh, yeah, that's fine. You know, so this was about flash, you know, how flash memory is. So flash memory is the stuff that's in all the Apple iPhones and iPods and Apple's consuming 90% of the flash memory in the world. As a result of what they're doing, they're driving the cost down lower and lower and lower faster than people expected, which made it actually capable of being an enterprise technology. And so we took consumer flash and we built it into storage in the enterprise and it disrupted the whole storage market. It, a $25 billion market that was disrupted by this flash memory. We learned about it by talking, you know, by a lot of the work we did that was going on in academia. We sort of hung out at Stanford and Cal and other places and we found out about what was going on with this stuff. We talked to a lot of industry visionaries from the top, guys that were thinking about, it had been in storage, but were thinking about ways to disrupt the industry. And we ended up making a bunch of investments. And just to quantify this, you know, we've been, we made our first investment in 07. We've made eight investments. We've invested in $150 million and we're going to generate a billion dollars of that from that 150 off those eight <coughs> companies. It's not bad. It, you know, it, it pays a lot of bills for our investors. So again, think about things and themes. What are the waves that you guys are riding and why is it important? Another example, like we can skip this one. Here are some of the themes that we like to talk about. And so this is the sort of the trend, the disruption, and this is the theme. We've got some consumer themes, you know, big data, you hear a lot about that, but big data is in fact a theme. It's enabling a lot of things. In fact, um, you know, one of the emerging themes we're, we're talking about, I forget the name of the, of the team here, but Internet of Things to me is an emerging theme. So the, the guys who are working Raspberry Pi, is that you guys? Yeah, to me that's an emerging theme. But think about yourself in context of theme and especially as you market to investors, right? Put all the, put all the building blocks together for them. Here are the disruptive trends. You know, here's why this is a, a major opportunity. It's going to create a lot of value and here's what we're doing. You are the visionary. So remember when you do your presentation, you're going to get lots of coaching on this, I'm sure. But um, you have to sort of walk the investor, you know, by their hand and, and sort of bring them to your vision. You are the visionaries. Don't forget that you are the artists. So you know what you're going to build before you know, anyone else lead them to that. Um, you can keep going. I think they're, they're, you know, so what do we do to support? We do a lot of things since we do a lot of early investing, you know, a couple of things that we do is when we have the CIO forum, we take our companies and we introduce them to a bunch of CIOs. We have like a hundred active CIOs of Fortune 1000 companies. We, we give them a list of 40 companies, you know, in the enterprise space mostly. And we say, who do you want to meet? And they pick the five they want to meet. Then we bring in those five on a specific day and they do a 20 minute pitch, sort of like you guys do. You know, it's like a demo day for our companies um, and they love it. Uh, the CIOs love it because they get to see the latest and greatest technology and the companies love it because they get real world feedback. The other thing we do is we had, you know, we've had a Lightspeed Summer Fellowship Program for seven years now. Um, it's going on right now. Um, and we, you know, we, we, I think we had 250 teams apply. We took seven this year. Um, we give them grants just like here. Um, I applaud UCLA for that, not taking any ownership, just giving you grants. It's awesome. We do the same thing. Uh, take the money and we and we try to provide support and mentor these students. We've had a lot of really good teams come through. Uh, ben Silverman who who started Pinterest went through three years ago before Pinterest. Um, we've had teams now, half the teams are getting funded. We've had teams get acquired now already. So really excited and this is why we want to support this program too. It just shouldn't be at just light speed. It should be all over the place. Um, and, and UCLA should have a better program than the USC, right? So <laughs> they take ownership. I don't know why they do that. That's so screwy. Uh, finally, last slide. Uh, Evan doesn't like to talk about this. You've probably seen this slide, but uh, this is number 
millions of photos uploaded per day. Um, when we met him, he was doing 10 million photos a month. I think less than that, they got to that. Um, and now they're doing 200 million photos a day um, with only Facebook doing more. And he won't say this, but if you look at the trajectory, they pass Facebook. If the tra trajectory stays the same. Facebook does about 300 million a day. They do about 200 million a day. That was a couple months ago. So that's why we're excited about it. But that's all I have for my presentation. So thanks. All right, great. So we're going to go ahead and just kind of transition into doing a, <coughs> our format here, a little fireside chat. So Where's the fire? I know. Or <laughs> I would go up on the PowerPoint next time. I like that suggestion. So, uh, so yeah. So, yeah, that's uh, a good idea. Yeah. So, um, so yeah. So I think I know you, you kind of briefly touched on your story a little bit there, but you know, um, there's certainly lots of good things in there. Um, so you know, you came out of school, you were an econ major. You know, what 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 was the thought there after that? You know, were you go straight into a tech company or was Cisco after you got your MBA? Well, I wasn't smart enough to be an engineer. Um, they didn't really have a lot of entrepreneurship stuff like they do now. I wish they did. But econ was mostly econ and finance. So I learned how to be an accountant. I learned how to do econ. But I, for me, that wasn't what I wanted to do in, in life. So I got a job actually at a, um, I wouldn't call it a startup, but it was an early, you know, early revenue company in the Silicon Valley, you know, newly public. And, and that was, you know, I worked three summers while at UCLA doing that and then got a job there after UCLA. And it wasn't a great company. But sometimes you learn a lot at bad companies. So I learned a lot at a bad company. Um, and that got me to Stanford Business School. And then I went to Cisco and I actually learned how to do things right after that. But. Do you subscribe to the idea that, you know, essentially working at a startup, you're going to learn more than you will anywhere else? Or do you think it can be very, like, you know, maybe you get a bad startup? Um, you, know, cause we have you learn a lot in a bad startup, too. I think it depends on your role. But, yeah, I would I would encourage everyone. I mean, you guys... You're entrepreneurs. I don't have to encourage you to go do a startup. You're starting your own. Um, I think for those other people who don't necessarily have yeah. the idea, you know, should they be more startup oriented or, you know, is it, you know, hey, go work at a big company for a couple of years and then try to do a small round? I, you know, I used to think that way. Um, and certainly when I graduated, you had to go, you had to start from the bottom and work your way up. What's different about today is because of all the technology disruptions that there's an entire workforce, you know, <laughs> around my age and less, that's not as employable. And you guys know the technology as well as anybody. There's never been a better time to start a company out of school or in school than today. I mean, and Evan is a great example of that, right? So if you really want to be an entrepreneur, you can do it now in school. You should do it. And don't let anyone tell you what your career path is. I mean, he, he didn't. So I think it's awesome. I mean, I, I sort of wish I was, a, you know, coming out of college right now. So that's right. That's right. So when you got to Cisco, um, you know, did you have any background in enterprise, you know, from your other work or was that kind of you were totally new to that? Yeah. So my summer job, I'd worked in the storage industry. And um, well, it turns out what, what happened was um, just like Evan got introduced to Scott Cook of Intuit. I signed up for an alumni mentor. I don't know if you guys have that here, but we have alumni mentors at Stanford. And I signed up and I got assigned a guy named John Morgridge, who was CEO of a then private company called Cisco. Um, so it was a little bit lucky, but I said I wanted something in software or networking and, and he was the only networking company. Um, so I got to know John over two years and then, and then when I graduated, I was looking at jobs and had some offers and he said, well, why don't you come work at Cisco? You know, we, we haven't hired an MBA before. And I said, okay. And he had gone to business, you know, so I, I went and um, worked out. But, you know, one of the common themes here, I think, is you listen to Evan's story a bit is, you know, you sort of get opportunities thrown at you when you don't when you don't know it. But um, when you meet when you come across and meet people, um, you should latch on to them in any way you can and see if they'll help you. People, everybody, people generally like to, to read, you know, to help you. And because they got help in their career. And so when you find people like that, 
you know, that you think can be interesting to yourself, latch on and figure out where it can lead. But don't be afraid to take those opportunities and make the most out of them. I know it's a wish guy, uh, you know, like you always just talking about you have to ask, you know, and if you don't actually ask, and you know, you're never going to get it. So, you know, it's uh, as simple as sort of reaching out. And, don't be afraid to ask you know, for help. Uh, yeah. Um, so, yeah. So, so then, uh, so things obviously went well at, at Cisco, and you got a lot of, you know, industry expertise, I assume, that between all of that, that really informed you to get, go to the VC side and you know, feel like you can make knowledgeable investments in that space. Is that yeah, I, I don't know. Um, you know, I, I, I didn't even take the VC class in business school because I thought I'd never be a VC. I don't want to be a VC. I wanted to be a CEO. That's what I thought I wanted. Um, and then I got into Cisco and as things got bigger, I said, I don't really want to be a CEO. I don't want to, um, I don't want to work in a big company. So, and I had, I'd done acquisitions. I was the first guy doing acquisitions for Cisco. And so I got into sort of investments and acquisitions, started enjoying it. And a classmate of mine, from business school recruited me into venture capital, which is another thing. This your classmates tend to be really important to your career over time. Right, right. Okay, interesting. Okay, great. Um, and so, when you got into venture capital, what was your first investment? <laughs> I don't know, but I'm sure it failed. <laughs> Fair enough. No, I, actually, you know, it's funny because I got in in late in the '97, and um, it's probably the easiest easiest time ever of venture capital where you know you could make investments and most of them turned out good so um, so I, some of my early investments I had some IPOs early on and I thought I was really good at it you know and then we went through the 2000 early 2000s where you you couldn't make an investment that did well so then I thought I was really bad at it um, and now we're in a time when you know it's more more neutral and and there's good investments and bad investments so Get a better feel for. I've learned a lot along the way. Trust me. Yeah, I mean, do you feel like now because of all these factors that have changed, so like the idea of the companies being cheaper to start, um, those kinds of things, you just see a ton more deals now. Like I, I just imagine right now there's just so many more companies springing up. Yeah, they are cheaper to start, um, but that means there could be more of them, and that means that you know eventually, as they vie for more capital. Um, you know, there's more attrition. Right. So I think that's, everyone's talked about the, what do they call it, the Series A? Yeah. yeah. Um, and I, again, I work mostly in enterprise, so we don't have as much of that, but it's something for you guys to think about how you finance the, the company. Um, you know, if you're doing consumer, you know, you just have to keep it lean and mean, and you, you have a lot of people come in here and tell you how to do that. If you're doing enterprise, the best way to finance the company is with customers. Um, take a little bit of venture capital, I guess not debt though, <laughs> standard terms. Um. <laughs> That's right, you'll be on your way, so uh, yeah, yeah. I should explain that too, you, I think, was, you asked the question about the debt? So um, when we did the debt, um, we did it a 500k note, which is a pretty st actually standard thing. It notes, we do more notes than equity at that <clears throat> that size. You just don't sell equity at that size. Um, and we would have bought equity, but we did a note. Um, convertible into the, the Series A. And um, it was capped at like 4 pre or 4.2 pre. So it was a good price. And we also had some rights to do a certain percentage of the Series A. What happened was, as the company really was a rocket ship, evaluation you know, got really high and the Series A was in the 60s. And because of that, it made our terms look so good that it became hard to get that second investor. So we had to we had to work out and adjust our terms. And and he came to us, and you know, I actually got in the middle of it because my partner Jeremy and him were sort of trying to figure out how to do it. And I sort of said, let's do it this way. And so we figured out some ways to sort of modify the terms so we both had you know it was good for everybody, and he could go out and get a new investor for Series A alongside us. Right. Right. And yeah, I agree. I mean. Usually, most of the deals that we see in the very early stage are convertible yeah. notes, you know, and you can debate the cap or where that comes in. But I mean, but at the time, I mean, we made the investment. I don't know whether I mean, the company could have easily failed, right? I mean, mm -hmm. they didn't have that much some traction, and you know, two guys and one was a student, and 
Um, so we took some risk, and then all of a sudden it looked like a really good deal, and and that's that's why we had to sort of deal with it. <laughs> um, so, uh, what do you think about this whole trend of the consumerization of, of the enterprise? You know, and now it's happening, and um, for. If you're working on a consumer, you know, sort of technology, you should think about whether or not it is applicable to the enterprise. Some of I, you know, walked around and sort of, and and like you guys, I think it might be right. So, um, but the enterprise IT is so vast now that people are bringing stuff into work and it's accepted, whether it be an iPhone. You know, it started with the BlackBerry, I think. You know, iPhone. You know. Dropbox, I mean, on and on and on, is these technologies are getting dragged into the enterprise departmentally. And and then that's the impetus for sort of land and expand um, technologies. And so we back a lot of companies that that is their strategy, is land and expand, is go around IT into a department, get your footprint, and then expand your footprint. So it's a very, very viable um, way to sell to enterprise without having a deal with the, all the suits in the, in the IT. Right, right. So, so you're looking at a deal, and I, mean, I think one of the main things that you, you know, our companies really want to hear is sort of the main criteria that you tend to look for, um, whether that's about the team themselves or the overall opportunity. I mean, you can give some thoughts on that. Yeah, so, I mean, we probably look at deals the same way you do. I mean, you're making an investment in a company, right? Your own personal investment of your time. Um, but it all, it all starts with the team, the, you know, the artists. So, you know, what do we want to see out of a team? Um, we want to see, you know, the technology side and we want to see the business side, certainly. We want to see the vision, how they work together. Um, so that's the first thing is what is the team made up of? Um, and, and you really got to nail the technology side, I think. It's, you know, sometimes the, the vision can can be fleeting a bit, but you got to nail the technology side. Um, you know, we look at the market opportunity. What's disrupting the market? Why is this an opportunity? And um, most of our best investments have been because of these huge technology disruptions or market disruptions. Um, you know, and then of course you fill in the gap with the product. What, what, how are you, how are you solving that problem? And you know, what is it? But it's it's really that simple. I mean, you can go into so much detail on stuff. If you just think about it when you present in that simple format is, remember VCs, we have, we have very short attention spans, um, just in general, and we want things to fit together nicely because we want to understand them. If VCs don't understand something, they'll just pass on it because they don't understand it. Doesn't mean it's not a great idea, but they just don't understand it. Um, I've certainly done that, you know, I don't understand everything, but I like things to fit together nicely and I want this, I want to be able to tell the story back. Um, Snapchat's pretty easy, right? My daughter taught, you know, showed me in 30 seconds, I got it. Okay, I get that. I understand. I'm not sure why you want to do this, but I get it. <laughs> um, so tell your story that way, right? This is why, this is, this is the need. This is how we're feeling it. This is why it's important. Um, and, and keep it so simple. Um, that's the worst thing you could do is is, is make the, the the pitch too complex because you'll lose people. And you guys usually uh, invest in, you know, say generically local in terms of your investment profile, or do you guys? I know you guys have some LA investments as well. Yeah, well, we're in uh, we're in Shoe Dazzle, um, Honest Company, Jessica Alba, um, Whisper, Snapchat. Um, we've had a couple others. So yeah, we like LA. Yeah. Um, I didn't realize the issue about the equity as much until I heard it today, though. I've heard a little bit about that, but um, yeah. I like the idea of having a little program that you can sort of calculate how much your equity is worth. Yeah, I agree. But I, I yeah. I think, I think it'll change pretty quickly as soon as you see some, some multi-billion dollar outcomes people realize, wow, you really can make a lot of money on the equity. You guys look at like New York at all or? Yeah, we got some deals in New York, a Bonobos, Men's Fashion, um, Pet Flow, a recurring dog food delivery thing. Okay. <laughs> um, 
We do some, we, but we do a lot of stuff in the Valley and yeah. there's some stuff in Texas and we also invest in Israel and India and we have a separate fund in China. So, you know, we're touching a lot of markets, um, but the themes tend to be reoccurring across those markets. Are there any companies that you've gone through and you thought like, yeah, I wish I could have that one back, like one that you missed or any, any of those kinds of stories? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I mean, Ben Silverman was in our, our summer grant program. We're not in Pinterest. Right, right. Shoot, same on us. Um, you know, people looked at Facebook. It was really high priced. Um, we looked at Twitter. It was, you know, got to be high priced really fast. I guess that's how some people felt about Snapchat. You know, 800 million for this company. It's, you know, two years old. Um, but these things, once they become platforms in consumer, they just, it's, it's like a runaway train. You can't stop them. Um, you know, so I, that's, yeah, well, no. it's always the consumer <laughs> ones that people talk about, but there's a lot of enterprise ones that you miss and they become multi-billion dollar outcomes and you sort of shake your head a little bit, but you know, there's not a call strike in venture capital. So, um, there's certainly some that I've done that we've lost money on that I'd like to have back, but that's part of taking the risk and you, you guys will all. I guarantee you will all do a failed startup at least once in your life. So just get over it and move on to the next thing. It's failure is to me is part of the part of the equation for learning. Um, you, and you should constantly iterate about stuff. I, I like the idea of actually I know a lot of people that take sort of daily logs on stuff. They just write down a lot of stuff and you just got to the faster you're learning, you know, the smarter you're going to get. On stuff. You know, it's interesting. Um, there was actually a blog post today about uh, about you know sort of accelerators and how people get tons of feedback, and they said they get whiplash because they're getting all these different viewpoints. Yeah. You know, and we have that here where people come in and they, they hear the pitch and they say, "Oh, you need to do X, Y, and Z or whatever," you know. And uh, and one of the suggestions, which was so basic, was just to like record the feedback in you know a spreadsheet and try to note it over time because it's like yeah. you know you're having Tons of people every week give you feedback, and uh, and we see it here, and and I, I get a lot of questions, you know, from people kind of saying like, how do I know what's good feedback, you know? And you don't. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Um, other than the fact that you can sort of look at the source, I look at the source a little bit, just to see the quality of the signal, signal to noise ratio, um, but you don't. And, you know, we all get bad advice and good advice and you have to sort of filter it out and make your own decisions. But that's the exciting thing about a startup. Like, there's no, there's no, you know, set formula. I mean, like Evan, people told him what, what do you say that you should make the picks, go to Best Buy and make the picture stay around. It's like, okay, whatever. <laughs> um, good idea. Right, right. Yeah, I think it goes back to that thing of like, you know, you being the domain expert. And, yeah. you know, you ultimately have to be the one who makes the call and, you know, and also they point out that I get it like, you know, if it's uh, an investor might give you a different kind of feedback than, I don't know, some other mentor, someone from industry and how you have to weigh them, you know, in the sense that an investor wants a very big opportunity. And yeah, and plus, and plus when you get investor feedback, you have to take it with a grain of salt. A lot of times they just make stuff up. They just don't like the deal and they'll make something up to make you feel better. Um, there's a lot of VCs that do that. There's, you know. I prefer to give really straightforward feedback. There's a sort of set of VCs that do that too, but you have to take it all with a grain of salt. Um, you know, I, I think the, a good idea is to surround yourself with some advisors that you trust, that are in notable people that, that maybe have some good experience, and 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 if you you can sort of triangulate, you know, feedback a little bit as you as you go and you start trusting people um, and their instincts a little bit more than. Than others, and so I think it's worthwhile to try to have that sort of advisor group, just not only in here but also outside. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, here, why don't we open it up to some questions here? So, any big pitfalls that companies at our stage should keep an eye out for? We get a lot of good advice on Pit what we should do, but what about pitfalls? We definitely should not. Do. It's a long list. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know. Um, I think there's times when you got to know when to. You got to know when to. Your idea is not a good idea. <laughs> first, <laughs> you know. I mean, part of it's persistence, but you know, 
part of it also is, is this, you know, do I need to pivot a bit? And you got to sort of take the data and you got to read the data. Um, so don't, you know, sometimes your, your, your heart can get in the way of, of, you know, your brain, right? And so read the data and collect as much data as you can on stuff, um, you know, and constantly iterate on that. Um, you know, team, team is, you know, sometimes the team chemistry may not be great. I can tell you the team chemistry isn't great at the start. It's going to be terrible, you know, two years into it. So, you know, not only should you have complementary skills, but you should have chemistry. You've got to be able to work. It's like being married when you're doing a startup. You're spending more time with this person than you are in, in a marriage with your wife or husband. Um, you know, um, the financing stuff is, is, is tough. It's, I mean, it's really stressful, as you heard earlier, that it's really stressful to go through. We're not easy um, to raise money from, and, um, and it places all sorts of demands on you. So um, I, I would suggest getting, that's a good place for advisors, to find advisors to help you navigate the fundraising environment. And, and you're going to hear a lot about VCs that are entrepreneur friendly and all that kind of crap. You know, I manage money for, for, um, for endowments and, you know, companies and public institutions and CalPERS and stuff like that. My job is not necessarily to be entrepreneur friendly. It's to get great deals and great companies and then help you guys be successful. Yes, we like to be friends with the entrepreneurs, but we're not going to give away great terms. That's our job is to do that. We're investing money to do that. So you got to recognize that, you know, the investors want a great deal, much like you do. What allowed Evan to, to get better deals later is he's because he's, his company is doing so well that people are falling over him to get in the company, in, in the company. So then he can dictate his own terms. But, you know, you do have to, I think he had good advice is, you know, you do have to make sure you have really good advisors on the financial side, on the legal side. You know, there's going to be some lawyers come through here. Use professional lawyers that are in the deal flow that do a lot of venture deals. That's, you know, why you need them because there's a lot of terms that can make or break this stuff. And, you know, and, and just be wary of the investors. I mean, you know, we're not like, we're going to try to screw you, but we want a good deal. That's what we're in business to do. Yeah. What do you think about patents in kind of web digital type businesses? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. The patent law just changed. And so um, now uh, you want to get your, you, if you have interesting technology, you want to create the IP early. So you want to go get provisionals as, as soon as possible. It's so the first person to get a provisional usually has the advantage now. Not necessarily the first person that was working on it. Um, having said that, I've never seen a company <laughs> use their patents for any good. Um, you know, when you get acquired, uh, sometimes they apply some, a, a company will apply some value to the patents. But the problem with patents is as a defense, you've got to have money to defend it. And lawyers cost a lot of money. It's five or ten million dollars to defend a patent lawsuit for a company. It's a lot of capital. So, um, well, I tell people, build up your portfolio um, because it's always a good threat to have it. And <clears throat> at some point, if you get acquired, the acquiring company that has a lot more money will value it. But don't don't use it as a defense because it's just it's it's hard to defend. Yeah. Um, for so we actually do have a provisional on, on what we're working on, and is there how do we leverage that to our advantage when we're approaching investors? Or um, how how important is the technology? Uh, it's novel. Novel. Yeah. Um, I just describe it. I just describe, hey, you know, here's our IP. This is our IP, and you know, we're applying for a patent. We believe we're going to get, you know we're first in line here, we're going to get that patent. But I think an investor will think about it the same way I do. Okay, great, I'm glad you guys have this technology, you know, but to defend it costs a lot of money. So, I mean, me, Pat, I mean, IP and patents are probably one of the most, to me, one of the most overrated parts of a company. 
because it's so easy for big companies to um, to attack them on that. What I think is is more important is taking the innovation around the IP and extending it and continuing to extend that. If you can do that, to me, that's how you, you keep technology leadership. Yeah. Um, so you talked about your formula, right? Yeah. Being yeah. In the um, but how do you know that you know, whether you're getting a Picasso or say a Thomas Kincaid. I mean, it's commercially viable, right? But I've had both. Okay. Yeah. So how, how do you I've had the, the guy with the fro that paints on TV. I've had him too, oh, I think. Yeah, yeah. I think I've had him. Um, <laughs> you know, um, part of its track, I mean, how, how many of you would consider yourselves artists, visionaries? How many of you think that you actually have some vision into where things are going? Yeah, of course. Absolutely. No, I, it's okay to raise your hand. I think you should. <laughs> um, it's, I mean, yeah, I would say when you're presenting, make sure that that comes across. You are the artist. You are the vision. This is where things are going. Um, but yeah, you know, where, how do you know? By, by looking at past history is a, is a good, you know, Picasso had a lot of cool stuff he did. So you figured the next thing he's going to do is probably going to be cool. Um, that's how you have to do that. But um, And he talked to a lot of people. I mean, there's really no one person has necessarily the vision, right? Someone may take a bunch of data and say, I think this is where things are going. You can test that vision with a lot of in industry people, which is what we do. We test academia. We test with lum industry luminaries. Constantly test. Um, and, and you'll either get, oh, that guy's crazy, doesn't know what he's talking about, or, wow, that, that actually is sort of interesting, that, that could be right. Um, you know, we found this guy, we, we sponsored a lot of this work at Stanford, they did this thing called Clean Slate. They said if you could design a network from scratch, what would it look like? They called it Clean States. So we gave them money, and one of the early PhD students, this guy Martin Casado, had an idea for how you would really turn networks from hardware to software. Um, and, and we believed that vision and, and we checked him out and all the people we said that this guy is brilliant and he know he gets it. And so, you know, we eventually put money in his company called Nicera. They were acquired for a billion dollars, you know, and he sort of was the guy that started software defined networking. So there's ways. Not that, then. You ever like see, um, do you ever take a person that comes in for a pitch and invest in them solely on the person itself rather than on the product they're selling? Like you see someone, you're like, this guy gets it. We're going to invest with him because we think he's going to make it regardless of what he is. Yeah, I have. An example of that? Um, <laughs> um, there's a, I had a, a guy that made me money in my pr a previous company. We sold his company to the company of Microsoft. I said, whatever you're doing, you know, I'll do the A round. And I did. And he's in the Hadoop space. He's got a great company. And, you know, back in the heyday, I remember, and this, I, I'm ashamed to even tell this story, but um, back in the heyday in the 19, late 1990s, you know, term sheets were flying. So I remember that there was a, an entrepreneur that I, that I knew well from my Cisco days that had sold three companies in a row and he was doing his fourth company. I met him at a trade show heard the pitch that he just gave me a pitch on the whiteboard and I gave him a term sheet right there. And I ended up making a 10 X on the deal in like six months. And I'm thinking, well, that, that was easy again, but you know, sort of stupidity at the time, but you have an instinct about people. It, again, it all comes back to people. There are certain people that, that are these artists. And when they're really artists, you want to invest in them because they do find the white spot, white spaces. They do, you know, know how to run companies. And they don't need our help. That's the most important thing. Is they're they're very self sufficient people. They'll call when they need something. Yeah. Do you judge the kind of commercial companies like Snapchat against a different standard for say enterprise investments? It's a good question. Um, yeah, they're really different beasts. They really are. It's funny in in consumer, um, in enterprise. It takes a lot longer to build a company. You feel like you have more IP. Um, you get a lot more customer sort of feedback along the way. And 
you know, but it's sort of a slower slog. But once you get there, you know, you can really build these substantial companies. You know, Sienna, Brocade, Fusion IO, they all become, you can become great big companies. The, in the consumer space, sometimes you can get this early traction and you think it's going to take off and all of a sudden it just falls off a cliff for some reason. They do something wrong or just people grow tired of it. Um, you know, in some cases, I think that's what people thought might happen. You know, Facebook, MySpace, you know, what, what the heck happened there? You know, um, Twitter, you know, Snapchat, who knows where it goes from here. It's pretty popular, you know, but it's still early. It's, you know, it's two years into the company. So yeah, we do. We, um, we tend to take, and it requires a little less capital to the cons to consumer. So we tend to do a lot more seeds in consumer, get it going, you know, get the app out there. See if we can get some customer, you know, feedback early. You know, it's pretty easy to do that. Enterprise, you can never do that. It takes so much money to build the product that you have to invest in the people and the team and their track record before. So, we, yeah, we do look at things a little bit differently. But, you know, on the consumer side, shoot, you, you know, you can, you can have much larger, those, those, those anomaly companies are much larger outcomes, right? The 20 billion, $50 billion outcomes. That you see, maybe you guys have a couple of goals in your life. Yeah, it's funny, it reminds me of a story um, an entrepreneur I talked with who um, he went in, he pitched uh, you know, this investor, and obviously the investor really liked him, but he pitched him a gaming company. And obviously, for all uh, your gaming companies, are not usually investors' yeah. favorite types of hit driven business, that kind of thing. And the investor told him, go walk out the door. And come back and pitch me any other idea, and yeah. I'll fund you. <laughs> <laughs> and he did, and he funded them, and now they're awesome. You know, they got a name around now, and whatever. You know, so it's uh, you know, but yeah. So I, I definitely think there's some validity, you know, to just you know the people angle and just be like, hey, you know, we just want to bet on that horse, and there you go, or the jockey rather. I guess. Another question, kind of following up with the uh, yeah. enterprise and consumer. If we had the ability to pick which ones we sell ourselves at, as an enterprise or consumer. Would you recommend going one way or another? Or <laughs> um, if I'd rather be a consumer VC, but I'm too old to do that, so I'm an enterprise VC, <laughs> and that's my background. But I think consumer is a lot more fun. Uh, I mean, enterprise. I think you know, if enterprise is in your blood. There's a lot of disruption happening in the enterprise: cloud, flash, big data. You know, it's all happening at, right now. There's not been as much. You know, there's as much disruption now in the enterprise as there's ever been. Um, so it's a great opportunity. But consumer, man, um, you know, we're at the beginning of the mobile thing, right? The internet thing is, you know, it's only like 20 years old, right? In terms of mosaic. You know, there's a lot of great stuff happening. And, and if you look at the growth in these apps and the growth of the penetration, it, it's so fast. You can build a big company literally overnight. I think that's exciting. And, you know, consumer stuff to me is, is probably a little more intuitive. Um, you know, it probably is for all you guys. You sort of, you can use it. So I, you know, lack of capital, it's easier to get, get things started, um, get customer feedback faster, and sort of fail fast. You know, and I think it's more interesting, frankly, but that's not what I do. But you know, it, the, the, the difference is that the bar is also a little lower for enterprise, um, for consumer. And there's a lot more consumer VCs running around. For enterprise, you know, someone said there's only like 20 guys that know how to do enterprise VC, but I don't know if that number is right, but it's a, it's a lot less. So to me, it, I'd rather swim around in a pool that, you know, where I'm, there's less fish and, and go after some really interesting I ideas. Yeah. Just another question. Dr. Long, yeah. So then what about, uh, I see you guys invested in Nest. So how do you guys deal yeah. with, say, consumer-grade technology that also though has like a physical, not quite enterprise-grade aspect, but they're still, they have to still build something? Yeah, and by the way, Nest is an example to the question I think you asked about you just invest in people. Tony Fidel's a great guy that, that we had, one of my partners had worked with before he was at Apple. He's sort of known as the father of the iPod and the iPhone and led, led those teams. Obviously, Steve Jobs was, but he, he was the guy leading those teams. Very visionary. So when he walked in our door and told us a story, we're like, okay, well, we're in. Um, and, you know, so what did we think about it? We thought it's consumer, but 
it's really not consumer. It's it's Internet of Things, because what's important, what's interesting about this is not that it's a great thermostat. It's that it actually connects back in to the Internet and provides a lot of data. It's a big data play because, you know, they can automate this stuff. Um, and it's highly disruptive um, because once you get these things in the home and you start putting them in other things, all of a sudden you can displace a lot of the typical ways that, you know, services are provided in the home. Why is security, why do we still have security provided the way we do? There's no reason. Security can be provided a lot easier. You know, we have sensors, we have big data. I mean, there's all sorts of things that we can do to provide better security in the home versus the crap you do now. So, you know, he's got a big, big vision. I mean, just on, on thermostats alone, I mean, he sells those things for, I don't know, 240 bucks a piece and they can do it over a hundred million in revenue and, you know, within two years. So, but you know, who would have thought, but you know, we sort of said, Hey, iPod, iPhone, GI thermostat. I don't know. You know, how many people have a nest? You tried it? No. A little expensive right now for your taste maybe, but over time cost goes down, you know, I mean, home automation is one thing that should all be controlled by your phone, right? So why, why, you know, and that's the other thing is this mobile mobile phone is and you guys probably get this it's it's a control point for a lot of things it has a lot of sensors in it it can see sensors different wireless sensors and pick up you know signals you can create actions from that so to me the mobile phone is a great opportunity to disrupt so many different traditional ways we do things so um, when you're talking about ways and i think you know particular to what we're doing on the app on the phone, you're seeing companies like the Novos and then brick and mortar retailers like um, Nordstrom, who's pretty forward thinking when it comes to technology, come together and collaborate. Yeah. Is, would you consider that a wave in the direction of how people are going to shop, whether you know there's e-commerce partnering up with brick and Yeah. At first I thought you said ways, and I'm thinking, yeah, that's another deal that we missed <laughs> in Israel. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> Could have owned 20% of that thing. Uh, gosh, waves. Yeah. So for e-commerce, any of you guys doing e-commerce? Yeah, we are. Okay. So, um, yeah, I mean, Bonova started all online. Right. What they realize is it's a lot more powerful when you have the online with some kind of offline component. So they have these little boutique stores. They started, they, they're in Nordstrom yeah. and it's, it's spectacularly successful in terms of dollars per square foot that they're creating. So they're, they're bringing off online investors offline. That to me is a big trend is, you know, a lot of people want to buy online. Obviously Amazon's proven that out, but a lot of people like the shopping experience. And so if you can bring people online to offline, that's big. And I, you know, I think that people like the Honest Company will, you know, will do some of that too. Yeah. And I got, yeah. So anyone, anyone customer of the Honest Company? Does anyone have kids? Okay. Yeah, diapers, honest company. Jessica Alba, you know who that is? Okay. Okay. We have Brian Lee on our advisory board too. So you know, Brian Lee's great. Yeah. Is he coming in to talk? Yeah. yeah. He's great. Yeah. So you guys don't miss the Brian Lee talk. He's started a couple companies for us. Awesome dude. He's the UCLA, you know, law, I think. And undergrad. Grad and undergrad. And he's got a lot of lessons. I mean, these are the all the questions you're asking me, you should ask him because he's He's got the scars to prove it. That's right. That's right. So, uh, so yeah. How many people are um, so mobile stuff? How many mobile companies here? Okay, consumer mobile. Yeah, one, two, uh, three. Yeah, probably like four. Yeah. 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 And then online. The rest is all online. Any non-traditional or, or, or not online? <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Okay. Medical device. Okay. And then, yeah. So, so, one of you guys, mobile guys, who raised you, you guy in the you guy in the back. Sorry, I forget your name, but what's what's the big disruptive trend for you? We're trying to connect people with our platform so that they can play sports or physical games, like mini games, and 
against each other by recording themselves playing, recording their attempt at that game. So we're starting out with our example game is a uh, free drag shooting. So someone can record themselves, or a friend can help them record the of the camera. And they'll try to hit as many shots as they can in a minute, you know, like chasing a ball or hitting rebounds, yeah. and then the winner will you know, win a prize. So is the trend, you know, rising boredom of society and then need to reach out to people to create events? I mean, I mean so, so the trend that, uh, same thing. Yeah. Um, basically, the first time ever you have this whole thing in your pocket, we can allow you to basically record anything you want yeah. and share it over a much larger network. That's one disruption. So that's what we think is hugely disruptive. The speeds really weren't there in the past to do this kind of thing. We think for a lot of sports, like there are plenty of uh, nerds like ourselves that love to play video games against each other, like World of Warcraft or what have you, in a social environment. But what if you're a more jockish kind of guy that really wants to compete in a larger format? Uh, so for the first time ever, we're really going to enable people to compete in that larger format um, from anything from you know, basketball yeah. to beer pong and bowling. So, I mean, That's a that was a great soundbite, by the way. Did everyone hear that? I mean, that what you just said, and you know, add on to yours is that's as an investor, that's what I want to hear. In fact, make that your first slide. I mean, seriously, I mean, that, what you just said to me, okay, I know I get that, what you want to do. Now, how do I play beer pong against somebody else? Another. Uh, it took us a while to figure that out. I've learned to play beer pong <laughs> with my kids. But uh, figure one cup um, at a given distance, like six feet, where you can... How many, issues. how many you can get in it? Yeah, and, and basically measuring it via like common household items um, so we can see how far it is. So just one cup and see it. Well, I can see that being popular in colleges yeah, and stuff. So, yeah. and we're trying to look at all the games of skill. So. That's great. Yeah. But anyway, that, that's that's a good example of how I want to hear things. Just how many of you guys are undergrad UCLA students? Still, you haven't graduated yet. And how many graduate students? And graduate in what 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 departments? MBA, Anderson. Yeah. We're a uh, political science. Engineering. Yeah, bioengineer. Yeah, bioengineer. And Anderson. Anderson. And how did you guys find each other? The engineering. Uh, I pitched him at uh, just some of them and took him to lunch in person. Actually, figuring out that interaction is yeah. a big thing for us is sort of you know pairing founders together. But why isn't there a site for that? So I'm going to build an app. There's Find the engineer wrong. app. Is there? Yeah. What's it called? Check out a co-founder's lab. It's a really good one. There's a couple of them. I'm trying to try and figure that out. Um, but I wouldn't say anyone's like quite had the you know, secret sauce on yeah. that. So. so you guys are coming up to pitch on the 28th? Yeah. So you know, at our place, and I'll, I invited a couple, invited some other angels outside of Lightspeed to attend, just so it's a real thing. Um, so we look forward to, how long are the pitches? Um, well, we can make them however long you want. <laughs> <laughs> max, of, max of five minutes. Well, they're, they're all thinking short attention span, yeah, three minutes? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, um, yeah. So we, we have the final ones for the program are five minutes, but we can make them, depending on the time frames and whatnot, we can give you like three minutes or yeah, I guess uh, I have one more other question for then you guys is, where do you go from here with your company? Let's say you, you get out of this program and you feel like we may have something, where do you take it? What's the next step for you? For yeah. It's really making sure statistically that our product can deliver. But how about like financing wise? I mean, how, are you going to, is this something you're going to go all do? Yeah. Go try to raise capital for or just bootstrap it? Yeah, some of them I think will kind of go off on, on there and others will be applying to other accelerators. Okay, there's an accelerator process. you can go to after yeah, this. Yeah, can go after that. That's the problem. We had other teams do last year. Um, yeah. And then some will, you know, look at and some are current students and they'll go back to school. Too. <laughs> <laughs> so. Isn't there a program at UCLA where you can take some time off and come back? Yeah. Should be. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, they can have like big time off as well too. And I guess it's right. Yeah. 
you know, any questions that you, you haven't ever asked a VC that you would want to ask that might be? Yeah, this is really, like, I mean, sort of unprecedented yeah. access, you know, in the sense of, like, you know, very, really, you know, volunteered his time. He's an advisor to our program. Lightspeed is a sponsor of our program. So, you know, we're really happy to have all of your involvement, but certainly this is your chance, so. You know. yeah, I'll tell you that. I'll just leave it open. As you seek funding, um, and you're getting term sheets or people are, you know, feel free to just reach out to me. I'm happy to give you input as an advisor on the funding and I'll, you know, entrepreneur friendly input. Um, <laughs> and I'll try to tell you where they're coming from and maybe help you with negotiation because um, you can always, but love to see all you guys, you know, find something you're passionate about and start companies. I think that's awesome. Don't forget to come back here then and help future classes. Yeah. Uh, so the four or five of us that are still on your grants, is it necessary to take break from school to get finance? Is that standard? Evan didn't. Okay. No. Okay. He was a student, but you know, he was the kind of kid that was working full time on it and had crappy grades as a result, I think. <laughs> yeah. But um but you know, okay. I don't think he had bad grades actually. Okay. I know you're an MBA yourself, yeah. but is there kind of a bias against teams that are MBA as opposed to all engineering teams? Um, I, like, I like seeing a business guy. I always think of an MBA as a business guy with a technical guy. Um, you know, I think the bias has evolved quite a bit that um, people coming out of undergrad can be just as market savvy as MBAs. But, you know, I tend to like seeing MBAs around the table. So. UCLA is a good, really good program. Um, but I just think you have to have that business guy and, and the technical guy. Did I answer the question? Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, it used to be a lot more important than it is now. I think because we've seen a number of people start a lot of prominent founders that do not have MBAs. So, frankly, I think they should just let, I like the idea of some someone having a doing an undergrad and then letting them go straight into an MBA. So maybe a five-year program where you get an undergrad plus an MBA at UCLA and come out of it. I think that would be an interesting program. Speaking of education, so you still find value in an MBA? <laughs> oh, we have an yeah. MBA on our team who's thinking doing that. Um, yeah, I, I, again, it's, it, my, my thinking has evolved a lot. When I, when I went to get my MBA, it was highly valued. I mean, and you know, that's sort of, you had to do an MBA to have a path into certain professions, including venture capital. It's no longer true. Um, I think that MBA teaches you some really important skills and ways to look at businesses. That is the value. And the network of people that are in your class is a really highly valued. Um, but I'm not sure that, you know, that MBA classes train you for a lot of the things you're going to see in a startup. I do think that you're going to learn a lot more in a startup than you will learn in a classroom. But the classroom gives you some skills for when you get into those tight situations in a startup, how to think about it. So, you know, yeah. I'm not trying to monopolize your topic, yeah. but um, how heavily do you weight LOIs um, in terms of making decisions? Because I know you're like more on the enterprise side. Yeah. So, I mean, what do you look at in terms of having an LOI in place that would make you invest in a firm? Like, is it a matter of size or number? Or yeah, um, I just call customers. I mean, you know, whether you I mean an LOI in terms of a, a customer LOI. So, if you, if, if, if firm has an adequate capital to do something that requires like a large build out and they have letters of intent from the clients, um, is that sufficient for you to fund them or do you really want to see customer traction? I will call the customer directly and talk to them and understand exactly what their intent is. So, I, you know, I, it's nice to have the LOI, but for me, it doesn't mean a lot. I just, I will tell. You know, give me five customers I can talk to and I'll go call and then I'll introduce you to some customers that I know and get the feedback from them. But that, to me, the customer input is so, so valuable for anything that you do. It's just, you know, the customer is where all the answers are, right? Whether it's consumer or enterprise. That's the other thing I would say is, um, you talk to a lot of good CEOs and you'll have a bunch come through here, I think. Um, the, the best CEOs stay really close to the customer. 
especially on the enterprise side. They're out. They're traveling every week. Every week they're visiting customers somewhere. And in consumer, I think you also got to be really close to the trends and the data. You know what Evan does is he he you know his one of his secrets is he his sister is in college and so he feeds her a bunch of stuff like some of the secret there's these little secret codes on Snapchat to make things look like a negative picture a black and white picture I don't know if you know about that stuff but he'll feed that to his sister and have her feed it to her friends just to test it out it's it's sort of a way of staying close to the consumer though right so yeah uh, can you give some of your opinion <laughs> like that. Like, your aspect, are these things actually possible because they seem like good tactics? If, if not, not at the early stages. They're not. No, they're just, they're just not. I mean, once you have a lot of leverage, like Evan has, and you have a company that everyone thinks is hot, or you're a repeat entrepreneur that anyone wants to back, then you can do that. But the problem is, if you do it and you blink, then it can really backfire. If you come in and say, I'm gonna, I, you know, I need 800 pre, and then you get no takers, people are gonna say, well, he's full of shit, you know, he's, you know, he's gonna get 800 pre. But in the beginning, I think you have to go with what, you know, terms. And I would just say raise as little of, as little as possible, right? Just figure out exactly, how, you know, what you need to get to that next milestone, run really lean, and take as little capital as possible. I shouldn't be saying that. I want to give you a lot, but. You know, run, run lean. And then as you get your company progresses, if it's positive, leverage starts coming your way, right? Um, but on the other hand, you do need to give away, to capitalize the company, you're going to have to give part of it away. So just factor that in. Maybe not in LA, I guess. The engineers don't want. But I mean, I, I usually look at, like, I, I like a nice, on the enterprise side, at least, I like a nice split cap table. I like to see, about 40 to 50 percent owned by the investors, 30 percent owned by the founders, uh, 30 to 40 call it, and then 20 percent option pool. That's what I like to see. That's pretty standard. Now, consumer can be a lot different. And I can tell you, yeah. So. We have time for maybe, yeah. One more, more question, more? anybody? All right. Got through the All right. Well, thank you so much for coming. Awesome.